So there's a story in the Bible where this Gentile woman seems like she's calling Jesus out and he almost praises her for it and gives her exactly what she wants. What's going on in that story? We're going to take a look at it today, Jay Walkers, and it is in Mark chapter 7. So let's read about it. My title in the ESV Bible, you know, they added little titles to kind of help people see where stuff was. And it's called the Syrophoenician Woman's Faith. And it says, and from there he rose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, so let's just start there because the Syrophoenician woman, that's, uh, that means that this lady is a Phoenician from the land of Syria, which is not a part of Egypt. So on a map, he's coming from uh, this area where it's a little bit to the south. It's called Gennesaret, and it's sort of by Capernaum, uh, by the Sea of Galilee. And about 50 miles north and a little bit west, outside of the borders of Israel, Jesus is heading to these places called Tyre and Sidon. They're usually mentioned together in the Bible, but they're two separate cities that are a uh, little ways apart. He's, he's heading up to that region, and he's meeting with these people and seeing these people that they, would, would be, they wouldn't be Israelites. They would be Syrian, or they would be Phoenician. They'd be a different race of people, a different group of people. They're Gentiles. And we'll talk about it in a little bit, but basically Jewish people and Gentiles did not interact. And so that is interesting enough, but let's, let's continue reading. So that's where Jesus is and that's where he came from. He rose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. So what's going on here? Is Jesus being sneaky? Is, is he ashamed of what he's doing? Absolutely not. So what's actually happening is a couple things. Number one, uh, it says he entered a house. That right there would be like breaking down a barrier because that's not what Jewish people did when they entered the Gentiles region. Uh, we just heard about in the last mini section because remember every time you read a bible story it's part of a bigger chapter which is making a point and it's part of a book which is making a point and it's part of the bible so we have to look at it in all of those different contexts and right here they just started or they just finished talking about how uh what goes into a person doesn't defile them but what comes out is is what defiles them so we've got you know, Jesus talking about food. And basically what he's doing is he's preparing for the future when he's going to say that all foods are clean. And that happens in the book of Acts. Well, another thing happens in the book of Acts too. And it's the fact that Jewish and Gentile barriers are broken down and the offering of Christ's sacrifice is known and made available to all people, whether they're Jew or Gentile. So this is really an extension of that previous paragraph talking about how all food is clean. This section is talking about how all people are clean. And it's not there yet. Jesus knows that this isn't done yet. It's not fulfilled yet. Just like the food laws aren't fulfilled yet. But a day is coming and he's kind of setting it up right now and showing you, hey, I, I know that this is on the way. I'm aware of what I'm doing here. This is not a mistake. All people, all foods are clean. It's a pretty cool story. It says he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. So why wouldn't he have wanted anyone to know? Uh, the reason why he didn't want anyone to know is because he didn't want to offend anybody. So the culture that he was a part of there was this barrier between Jewish people and Gentile people. And so for him to go in and just be like, hey, everybody, what's up? Here I am. It would have been offensive to some of his Jewish brothers. It probably would have been offensive to some of the Gentile people too. Because these people were in the same area, but they didn't really get along. So... It's like groups of people that maybe like if you have two bordering nations, like uh, the best example I can think of would be like in Europe, like 
Spain and Portugal or France and Germany or something and they've got their own like identity and they don't want to interact with someone from a different space than them uh, and and so this is kind of what's going on there and for them to just go start hanging out and eating and treating it like normal would have been offensive to some people not that Jesus was like super concerned about not offending people he did it plenty but in this case he was probably just trying to make his point be in his area without necessarily stirring anything up uh and so that's what it says it says yet he could not be hidden and i love that because it's just a reminder of who jesus is when he's there you know he's there when his presence is in an area he can't be hidden so he might have been trying to hide to kind of take a break because we know he did that to recharge and reset uh he may have gone up here specifically for the purpose of what's about to happen next but in any case even when jesus is trying to kind of lay low he can't because he's the son of god he's jesus he's special unique he's perfect so then it says but immediately that word that we see all the time. A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. So let's look at this woman. She hears about Jesus. She finds out he's in her region and she doesn't worry about any barriers at all. She goes and she falls down at his feet because she has a need. She has a daughter who is being tormented by a, an unclean spirit. And it says, now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. So she's not an Israelite woman. She was probably born and raised in that area of Tyre and Sidon that's outside of Israel. She's probably lived there her entire life. And she begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. So she must've heard some of the things that Jesus had done that he can cast out demons, that he can heal sick people. And she's like, this is my chance. I'm gonna throw myself at his feet. Great place to throw yourself. And that's what she did. And then it says, uh, she, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, verse 27. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Man, Jesus, that seems pretty mean. Uh, doesn't it? <laughs> he says, let the children be fed first. So he's talking about the people of Israel. So Jesus' mission was clear. He came to Israel because Israel was the nation that was representing God to the other nations around them. And so he's there to reveal himself to them as God had done to Abraham and through all the kings and all the history of Israel. They were the chosen people of God to represent him, to be blessed by him so that they could go and be a blessing to others. Uh, and it says, so let the children be fed first for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Uh, so that term dogs, it, it, the, the Greek actually has the context of like the little dogs, but that word dogs would have been an offensive word. So the Gentiles to the Israelite people were like dogs. Jesus softened it by saying little dogs instead of by saying just dogs. Uh, but nonetheless, that's kind of like an offensive term calling someone almost like less than human in a way. Uh, so it says, but she answered him. So in this moment, she could have been really upset. She could have been mad. She could have been like, I can't believe that this guy just called me a dog. Right. But this is her response. She answered him. Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So her response was a few things. It was short sweet it was humble she agreed with him and didn't argue with him or try to fight him on it she wasn't offended 
because she'd come to him and she was seeking something. And he says, this isn't the mission that I'm on right now, but I'm on a mission to speak to the Israelites, to the people, the children of God that he's called, not to someone from somewhere else. And, and, and she acknowledges it and says, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So she's like, I'm just looking for something. I'm looking for some hope. I'm looking for somebody who can help me with my daughter. And it says, and he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. So that statement is one that we want to pay attention to because that statement got her her way. It got her her healing. It got her her miracle. And the, the interesting thing about that statement is that it doesn't seem like much, but it impressed Jesus. And it says, and she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So Jesus did this from a distance. He uh, remotely distance <laughs> cast this demon out and he can do that. He's, he's powerful enough to do that. But why did he do that when it just a moment earlier, it seemed like he was saying like, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I didn't come to do that. I think it's uh, the humility of this woman coming to him. Because from the beginning, she was being humble. She came and she laid down at his feet. And then she begged him. These are things that are humble things to do. They're not, you know, something a proud person does. So she came to him humbly, weak, unable to do it for herself and she knew that and and then jesus says you know it's almost like she's want, he's wanting to see how how badly she really wants this or or if she is super serious about it because because he's like look this is not my mission right now but jesus always finds time for people who humbly come to him and seek him and so where she could have gotten mad, where she could have just quit trying, she didn't. This woman was humble, this woman was sincere, and she was persistent. She didn't quit, she didn't stop. She said, it might be true that you didn't come for me, but I think that there's something for me too. And Jesus says, you're right. There is something for you too. So this story that could seem like, you know, it paints Jesus in this picture of being like short-sighted or maybe rude or uninterested or sneaky even, because a little bit earlier when it says, you know, he was almost trying to make sure nobody saw him. When we really look at it, we see what he's actually doing. What he's actually doing is he's breaking down a major major barrier between ethnic groups of people that are different. He was not trying to be racist. He wasn't trying to be sexist. He wasn't trying to be any of those things. He was trying to be loving. He was trying to be caring, but he was trying to be focused. See, what we can learn from Jesus is that there are times where we're easily pulled from our mission. You know, we start looking at, you know, all these other directions and all these other things. But Jesus knew why he came. He knew why he came. He came for the people of Israel to be given a chance to see him and know him. But he also knew what was coming. See, that's the difference between us and Jesus sometimes. God's given us some pieces of what's coming in his word. But other places, we don't know what our future holds. Jesus knew that Israel was going to reject him. And that when they did that, there were going to be some who, who would choose him later from the Israelite people. But that offer of salvation was going to be offered to everyone in the world. And so this is a precursor to that. Where Jesus says, I want you to see something. Not only is all food clean, but 
these traditions, these commandments, these things that, you know, have been this way for so long, like, like the tension between Jews and Gentiles, all that I'm coming to fix. I'm coming to deal with. I'm coming to step into that story. And he steps into that story in the middle of his ministry so that you can see it already. And I love that about Jesus. So this is a really cool little story about a lady from Syria, a Phoenician woman uh, who was not part of the mission of Christ directly, but because she came to him humbly, because she came to him sincerely, because she persisted, Christ took a moment, Jesus stopped, saw her, and met her need. And that's a recipe for how we should pray. Our prayers should be humble. Our prayers should be sincere. Our prayers should be pointed. We should come to the feet of Jesus and we should say, this is something I can't do on my own, God. And when we feel like we get an answer that's no, we just keep praying. We just keep asking. We just keep swimming. <laughs> and, and we see God turn his focus and his attention to us and say, you know, go your way. I'll, I'll, I'll do what you asked of me. I'll, I'll, I'll meet that need. And it's not necessarily in the time that we want and it's not necessarily how we want or when we want, but God's going to answer the prayers of a person who persists and of a person who comes humbly. And we see that here for somebody that was not even on his radar to, to minister to. Uh, he was not looking to do that. But Jesus is Jesus. And, and that means he's filled with compassion. He's filled, filled with grace. He's filled with mercy. He's filled with love. And when we humbly come to him, he'll stop. He'll see us. And he'll meet us in that place. So I just... I really like that story and I hope that that was uh, eye-opening to you in, in some way or another. It's one of those stories that maybe is a little bit difficult when you come across it the first time, like what's happening, but hopefully uh, that makes a little bit of sense of, of what's going on there. And I just want you to know if you're a person who feels like, you know, you're not one of God's children right now, uh, maybe you don't feel like you have the background or like you don't feel like you've done the things in your life that you were supposed to do the way that you were supposed to do them. Uh, maybe this is a message for you that you're not too far from Jesus. You'll see him. He's not trying to hide from you. He can't be hidden, <laughs> this says. So if you're looking, you'll see him and you'll hear about all the amazing things that he's done. and. And he's still doing those things today, even though he's not walking the earth. He's still saving people. He's still performing miracles and he's doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to invite you into that story. I want to invite you into the gift that he has for you today. Uh, because just like he took that demon out of that little girl, he wants to come and fight and be victorious against sin in your life. You can't overcome it by yourself. So you come to him humbly and you say, Jesus, I need you. And you beg him to remove it. And he does. So let's pray that today. Uh, if you're a person who realizes that you need him. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for coming to, to my area even though it wasn't on your radar maybe when you first walked the earth. I'm one of those Gentiles. I'm one of those people that was not an Israelite from birth. And God, I just thank you that you see me. I thank you that even though I'm undeserving and unworthy, that you save me and heal me and make me new. God, I am a sinner and I'm sorry for that, for all the things that I've done wrong against you. I've disobeyed you. God, I ask your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross to
to take the place of the punishment that I deserve for my sin, which is death. And that when he rose from the dead, he offered that gift of life to me. And so God, I accept that gift today. I want to walk in Jesus Christ. Please send your Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me. God, help me to live for you from this day forward and to try to make my life's aim to be more like you and to bring you glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you just prayed that prayer, you're a member of the body of Christ now. And that means a lot of things, but it means that for the rest of your life, you're going to be learning what it means to live for Jesus and like Jesus. And we want to invite you, Jay Walkers, to our Jay Walkers discipleship time that we have. Uh, we're in week five, maybe, of a 10-week discipleship course that we're doing. Uh, it's like training, you could call it. It's all about equipping people to be warriors for God because you just entered a battle, but it's a good battle to be in. It's the only one that's got eternal uh, things on the line. So join that battle with us Tuesday night, 6 p.m. on the Zoom call. You can get the number if you want to write it down to 739-6681-5494 and that's on Zoom. Uh, no password. And I'd love to see you there. Jaywalkers, have a great week. Love you. Bye.